On today's Visual Studio Toolbox, Chris Woodworth and I wrap up our three-part series on building web API. We're going to talk about best practices and architecture. Hi, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Robert Green, and with me is Chris Woodruff. Hey, Chris. Hey, Robert. How are you? I'm awesome. Excellent. We are wrapping up, for now, our three-part series on Web API. Yep. So in episode one, we showed how to create a Web API. So that Using was pretty straightforward. ASP Core. ASP Core. Yep. Uh, in episode two, we showed integration testing, which is a new feature in ASP.NET Core. Awesome very, stuff. very cool for yep. really easily testing what happens if you call the service, do you get back success or error codes? Yep. Not testing the data, but testing the calling of the service. Yep. Really easy to do. And then today, we're going to talk a little bit about best practices and architecture. Because um, yeah. you, know, you kind of look at our sample code, and you know, we know about an MVC and separation of concerns, and MVVM and separation of concerns, but in our little project here, Everything's kind of dumped together, yeah. so we should probably talk about that. Yeah. And then, what are some of the best practices for doing this for real? Yeah. Cool. And, and I don't have all the answers, so I'll, I'll say that to begin with. I just have my example, yep. and everyone can can take my example and make it better. Sure. Because there, there's we'll a just, lot of smarter people we'll out learn there a few than things. Me. So, I'm, I'm usually the dumbest person in the room. <laughs> I just know a lot of smart people, so so that's my uh, exactly. that's my gift. So, but yeah, so we're gonna look at architecture, and we're gonna really just uh, uh, reinforce this idea of decoupling. If I yeah. if, if this talk is about anything, it's really about decoupling concerns and right. decoupling responsibilities. And and we're gonna see doing that but using a lot of the same techniques that you're already used to. So it's not yeah. like there's an entirely different way you decouple, oh. right? MVC and MVVM yeah. are, are similar. Yeah. If you've seen one, you kind of understand what the other one does. Yeah. We're going to use very similar yeah. techniques here. So we're going to look at a modified, more advanced, like N-tier architecture. Okay. Uh, maybe I could come back and we could do a talk on hexagonal, hexagonal architecture, which is really more complex and it, it deals with domain driven programming and domain driven development but mm -hmm. we'll, we'll talk about that okay later. yeah we'll talk but about that later. this is more of a simple architecture <laughs> that that people can can really start using right away with their ASP.NET core web APIs okay so let's talk about what you and I do wrong because I take, we only have thirty minutes. Yeah, so yeah. So we, we're gonna have to whip well, through this yeah. list. <laughs> so bad habits. So what kind of bad habits do we have? Um, you know what? In the first uh, video that we showed, we were doing all of our data access from controllers, right? Right. In the actions. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a bad habit. That's kind of code be behind. Doing. Smacks of code behind. Yeah, yeah. It it really does. It really smacks of uh, of cramming all your code into one area, and then you're kind of locked in. Right. So don't do that. Even though we showed on the demo, don't do it for your production code. Uh, I say don't have all your code in a single project. Mm -hmm. One, it's hard to test. Two, if you're on a big team, you won't step on people's toes. And if you update one project, um, it may not, and you go through uh, CI, mm -hmm. continuous integration and building out on the server, it minimizes the work that those DevOps uh, uh, systems have to do. Right. And then we don't want to couple the data access, which in our case is Entity Framework Core, to our project domain knowledge. And I'll explain that um, okay. once we take a look at some of the uh, layers and once we take a look at the code. And then we, we don't want to forget, uh, and another bad habit is people don't think about unit testing and integration testing. Or they don't do it. They, they think about how they should do it, but they don't do enough of it. Yeah. And right. you should build your solutions, build your systems so that with testing in mind, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. 
Yeah, because if I build it in a way that I can't test everything, excuse me, then it it's a failure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you got to think about unit testing and integration testing. So how I build my APIs is I have this triangle in this case, but I have four different areas I look at. I have my API, which just handles the actual API that people call. Right. So it, it really contains all my controllers and my actions, and those correspond to my to entities, in this case, using, using this architecture, and it, uh, the actions correspond to different uh, verbs that we can do against those, those entity types. Mm -hmm. So with the Schnook database, we have like albums and artists as right. an example, and we can do things like get all of our artists or get all of our albums or get mm -hmm. one or delete or update or insert new, new uh, entities. So that's all the API should do. Then we take a look at domain. And domain is kind of the heart of my architecture. It, it really does, it's where all the business logic lives. It's where all the validation lives. Okay. It's, it's really the, the center and that's why it's in the center of this, this triangle or pyramid. And then data, I mean, you need to have some, some way to, to get data, even if right. it's mocking, right. you still have, you have to have data access to get, yep. to send back your mock data. But in this case, data in a production sense is where I have all of my entity framework core logic. Mm -hmm. And I separate it because I want to be able to test all, I want to be able to test my APIs and my domain against production database and mock right. database or mock data access, my mock data. And then the last one is tests, mm -hmm. which are important. Don't forget about tests. You right. have to have your test projects that go along with your uh, everything else. So we'll quickly go through what each layer should be. So, so API layer, uh, like a UI of a ASP.NET MVC uh, project, the API endpoints should not know anything about domain knowledge or data or the data access. All it should know is how to get those HTTP calls mm -hmm. and how to respond back yep. from those. So it's, this, it's, it's a view. The view doesn't know about the view model. The no. view doesn't know the exactly. terms about the model. Right. Exactly. It should interact with view models to ensure the, the greatest flexibility. Now, yeah. now, we were talking about this earlier, um, and I'm going to use an example. In my Chinook database, there's a entity called invoice. Mm -hmm. And invoices are made up of multiple invoice lines, right? But we don't know the total of the total amount of an invoice unless we know all of the invoice lines, right. individual costs. And so in most databases, in my databases, I don't save the total amount for an invoice. I calculate that right. on the fly. So if you take a look at, on one side we have our data models that are based one to one on, on the tables in our database. Mm -hmm. On the other side, I've got these view models. And how do I convert, how do I take a invoice uh, data model instance and convert it so it has a total property right. inside of it? It has to go through my domain layer and figure out all of the individual invoice lines, total those up, insert that into a property in the corresponding view model, mm -hmm. and then vice versa. When a view model comes in from my API and I don't have, and I have a total, maybe I use it to verify that that total right. equals all of the corresponding uh, invoice line rolled up total. Mm -hmm. So I use it for validation coming from the other way. Right. So that's why I, the API only deals with view models. It doesn't know anything about data, the data models. Domain layer, 
contains both my entity models, my data models, and my view models. Okay. So because it needs to do the conversion. Right. It contains all of my interfaces for my data retrievals so I can keep a well-defined standard for all my data access. Now, what I mean about what I mean by that is that if I have two uh, different ways that my API can get data, meaning maybe I get it from SQL Server and that's in one project and then I have another project for my mock mm -hmm. data, I, each one of those needs to know the interfaces that they have to adhere to, right. the contracts, so to say. And so my domain layer contains all of my contracts that my data access projects have to adhere to. Mm -hmm. Because if they don't, then they won't, they won't work well, or they won't work at all. Right. So all my interfaces are in my domain layer. And then this also allows me to use dependency injection for my repositories. Okay. So those, those repositories that live in those individual uh, data access projects can be injected into my domain layer. So if they're coming from repositories that use Entity Framework Core or use the mock, my mock access, mock data access, mm -hmm. the domain layer doesn't care. Right. It doesn't even, it really doesn't. It doesn't know. No. Sure. And then I think of my domain layer as a supervisor. And it's actual, there's an actual class called supervisor that does all the heavy lifting in there. Data layer, pretty simple. It's where all the heavy data lifting happens. Uh, everything that it does is defined based on interfaces from the domain layer. We talked about that. And in my uh, sample architecture instance, I use Entity Framework Core 2.1, mm -hmm. but you can use anything that uh, adheres to .NET Standard 2.0. Okay. Okay. And then I also use uh, Mock for, for testing up a data access layer for testing. And then my tests, I have two types of tests, integration that we looked at in yep. the previous video, and traditional unit testing. Which we cover fully with my series with Filter Pixie. Exactly. And uh, so this is integrated for API endpoint testing and controllers. So uh, we also test out our APIs and the, the controllers that are in the APIs. Uh, and then we cover all of our unit tests for our repositories and our individual uh, data access layers. Mm -hmm. You can test out, really you should be testing a lot more than I, than I show in my, in my sample. Okay. And that's it. All right. So, so let's dig in and show. Let's see the sample. Yeah, let's dig in and show the sample. Okay. So let's first take a look at the different projects. So if I collapse all these down and just show the different projects that we have, uh, there are a number of different projects. Like I said, we have Chinook.API. Now, I, I set up a, a naming convention for my projects where I have a base name and then yep. a dot and then whatever it corresponds to. So right. I have Chinook.API, Chinook.domain, Chinook.data, Chinook.integration test, mm -hmm. mock data. So I have two, so my mock data adheres to the same interfaces as my Chinook.data. Mm. And then I have integration tests, and then I have unit tests. In here I also have a MS unit test because my unit tests are all X unit, and I try to, to make sure that, that I'm gonna be running some, some MS unit tests for people that, that like that uh, library for testing. Okay. So I try not to be biased and, and, uh, and and uh, just look at one side. So the first thing I want to take a look at, and I'm going to I'm going to uh, close all these documents, is I want to take a look at my API. Now in my API, I'm going to show my startup, and I'm going to make this small. So in here, I recommend, and you don't have to do this, but I recommend not putting all all of my configuration stuff 
into my startup. So if you see here, I have a bunch of these like configure repositories and configure supervisor and add middleware and my cores, which we mm -hmm. never talked about. But I have all these things that I want to do that I want to inject and stand up for my services, but I don't want my configure services to be this gigantic method. So if you take a look out here under configurations, I have a uh, some classes that handle all those. And let's take a look at like configuring connections. So I have an add connection provider uh, call that basically goes out and gets the uh, connection string from my app settings.json mm -hmm. and it just sets that up, adds that uh, uh, DB context, injects that DB context into my project and then returns it. Okay. And, and for me, in my thinking, it, it is better for me to, to push all these stuff out so that I know what I'm, I'm working with instead of having this gigantic uh, method. Mm -hmm. So, so okay. that's one kind of best practice that I do in this architecture. If I go back to my startup, uh, I also use Swagger. Yep. I don't know if you know Swagger. I do. But in this, and this project is out on my uh, uh, GitHub repo okay. GitHub account. So it's a it's a repository that we'll probably link to in the yes in the episode notes. But uh, we use Swagger for this, mm -hmm. and Swagger is really simple. Swagger is kind of a uh, human readable form, uh, has a UI to it. So you can actually kind of see what you're working with, right? And we'll show it at the end of the uh, end of this video. It's kind of cool. Uh, you can see how that's set up. You can see how I do cores and and also some other things. But uh, don't want to dwell too deep. Uh, let's take a look at controllers because my controllers are dumb. They're very dumb. So, so this is a album controller, and uh, this is a get all. So this is a uh, action to get all albums. Mm -hmm. So all I do in here is I'm really just calling this Chinook supervisor, which was using dependency injection, was, was injected into this project. And if I take a look up here in the constructor, I just grab that, that Chinook supervisor, assign it to an internal private uh, property on this controller, and I can use it, and I just call get all album async. So I'm, mm -hmm. using, I'm using async calls all over the place so that I'm not uh, uh, kind of uh, hurting the performance right. of my API. And if I catch an exception coming back from from that, I send back a status code of 500 in this example. You can be more, you can get more advanced and fancy and do different things, but for this example, all I wanna know is, did I get some kind of internal error behind the controller action? Mm -hmm. If I did, I send back a 500, meaning I, I made the mistake, a 400 is you made the mistake. Okay. I made the mistake, so I'm going to send back a 500, and then I'm going to send back the exception, which will allow the person getting that response back to, to get some kind of um, information right. about the exception that handled that that occurred. And that's all I'm doing. I mean, if you take a look at all all of this, it's really kind of kind of simple. All my controller actions are very simple. Like if I want to get a specific ID, a specific album from the from the uh, corresponding data access, whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, I come in and I check to see if, uh, if that uh, album exists. So that uh, if it doesn't exist in my in the in the database, I send back a not found. Okay. And that's a 404, right? Right. Yeah. If I if everything gets sent back okay, I send back an okay with the response with that one album to be sent back. If I catch an exception, 
I send back a status code of 500. Okay. That this is all really my my uh, actions do my controllers do right. they they just get they call out to to my supervisor to get information to get data to get information mm -hmm. and then they send it back out or send back some error or some kind of other response code. So really, that's all my API project does. Right. Simple. So now, let's take a look at the data side okay. of the solution. So the data side is actually really simple also. It's just data access. Yep. That's all we're doing. Sure. We, don't, we don't care about validation or making sure that the data is correct. We mm -hmm. just get it and send it back. So we really just have these repositories. So we're using the repository pattern to, to make, uh, to have all these calls. And they really just correspond to, to uh, uh, certain things like we, can, we have a call that says album exists. Mm -hmm. So it just goes out and says, does this ID exist in the, in the database? Yep. And then we have like get all async and get, get by ID async and add async and I mean, our CRUD it's calls, just right? Straightforward it's just EF straight, stuff. Yeah, it's yep. just straightforward EF stuff. Um, and it's, it's really basic stuff. Okay. Okay. So, so we're still doing kind of boring stuff. So, uh, but let's get into the domain now. So let's close that out. Our domain is a little interesting. So, so we, we keep all of our stuff in here. So when I created and generated my entity models, mm -hmm. they actually got created in the data access layer. But I right. actually pulled them out because okay. all of my data, all of my data access, my mock and my, my SQL server mm -hmm. have to adhere to the same, the same entity models, right? right? So I wanted to keep them separated from, from each one of my data access layers. So I keep them in my, my domain so that everyone can reference them and they're referencing the same classes. Mm -hmm. They don't have different classes and someone could go in and modify one entity class in one project and it would break the other one and break the whole, right. break the whole thing. I also have... Uh, my view models, which correspond to what I'm interacting with with the API. And are these the same view models that you would write in a XAML application? Yeah, it's okay. the same corresponding. Okay, I mean, cool. they're just, mm -hmm. I mean, and they almost look exactly alike. So if I take a look at uh, album, mm -hmm. you can see album is made up of an album ID, a title, and an artist ID. Yeah. But what if I wanted an album to also have the artist's name included in it. Right. So this is an example where I have a view model that is has a slightly different shape. Okay, so this is a different view model than the view model we have in MVVM. Yeah. The view model in MVVM does the actual data manipulation. Yeah, so this, no, it doesn't okay. do that. This is just, this okay. is just basically giving me the shape that I want to work with Got through it. my okay. API. All right. So you can see that the only thing that's really different between the two is really in this, okay. I've, I've inserted a artist name All right. into my view model so that I want, when I send back and someone says, give me all the albums that were, uh, that were created by, or maybe if I had some kind of date on this, maybe mm -hmm. I could say, give me all the albums that were created in 1979. Right. Right. Or, or produced in 1970. Or you want all Dave Matthews albums. Sometimes yeah. it's Dave Matthews. Sometimes and it's Dave, Dave Matthews, Matthews band, band, right? Yeah, but exactly. Dave Matthews. Sure. So, so we've got that. So that's just an example why I have entity models and view models mm -hmm. is because sometimes I want different stuff to be to work with the APIs. Right. So if we... Also, we have our repositories, and these are just our interfaces. Okay. So that's why mm. I keep all of my interfaces in this domain so that, cool. all, right. that all of my data access have to adhere to these contracts. Right. Okay. And the last two are I have 
my supervisor, which is mm. just one gigantic class. I, I don't really like it, but I couldn't get away from having a bunch of circular reference uh, issues. So I have one gigantic, I call it the Chinook supervisor, and it gets injected all of the repositories that I'm working with. So you can see here that in the constructor, I get back all of the repositories from whatever data access project I'm working with, mm -hmm. either the Mach 1 or the, the uh, Entity Framework Core 1. And it uses those repositories to do certain things. Like if I say, get all album async, I basically get all of my, I call that corresponding repository and say, give me back all my uh, albums. Mm -hmm. And then I convert that list over to view models. And mm -hmm. I have a bunch of converters that convert yeah. over. Now, okay. now, uh, um, I could use other third-party tools that that do that conversion automatically, mm -hmm. but I did converters just to show people what you could do. Right. So, so in the end, and then I convert them, and I don't really even need to do this anymore. I thought I got rid of all these, but but really, all the supervisor does is com it converts one side to the other either converts view models to entity mm. models or entity models to view models. Because I'm that, I tend to put that code in my view model. You, in you XAML could, applications, you could, yeah. It's kind of clunky. But I do it, and I could put some validation. I'm, I'm going to be I working. Kinda, I like the idea of separating that out because, you know, the, the view model is retrieving data and preparing it for the view. Right, but I so, don't have a view. So, yeah. so I call it a view model. I maybe I should call it like an API model. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So, so maybe I'm not calling it the right thing. Yeah. I'm calling it something to distinguish it from. Right. But even when it in in XAML apps, when it literally is the view model, I like the idea of of the view model calls out to something which goes and gets the data and then does the manipulation passes it back to the view model, which then turns around to the view and said, here's your data yeah. with album, with yeah. artist title attached or invoice yeah. already calculated yeah. instead of having that code yeah. living in the view model. So yeah. retrieve the data from the database and then yeah. do the, and the I, conversions. I break out all nice this technique. because because I can I can build unit tests against right. a supervisor yeah. object and I can build unit tests yeah. against a converter. Yes. And I can And it separates the, the concerns. If if you change the way you do the conversions, it's all in one place. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. I like that. So that's really my domain. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can also show you my mock data. My mock data looks almost like uh, my my uh, uh, data that uses Entity Framework. Uh, it just has really simple repositories. In this, I just create one for like get okay. all async for, for album. I'm just hand coding one album mm -hmm. and then I send it back. Now, I know you. there's more advanced, as you probably saw with Phil, there's more advanced ways to do mocking. Mm -hmm. This is just a simple way that one, people can, can see just how to do it right. we in used, a basic uh, sense. Mock Q or yeah. MO yeah. Mock or Mock Q or MOQ, MO -Q or however yeah. you pronounce there's tons, it. There's tons yeah. of ways to do it. This is just a simple way that I'm just sending back one one thing mm -hmm. and, and it's just a bare bone as basic as it can get. Okay. So and would I do this for production? No. For like a real production API, no. Right. This is just a demo. Sure. And then, again, uh, as you've seen in the in the last video, this is the same exact thing that we were doing before with integration yep. testing. You can go back and take a look at that video. Yep. And uh, you get your unit tests in there as and well. And then of I course. have and then I have unit tests down below where I in this example I just unit test my repositories. Mm -hmm. And these actually. Uh, uh, go out and unit test the mock, 
the mock uh, data access. Okay. Because I, some of these tests, I check to see how many, uh, how many instances, entity instances I'm returning. Mm -hmm. So I really want that done in a, in a mock sure. right. uh, environment. Right. You don't so want to tax the database. You don't want to spin up Azure charges. Yeah. You don't want to have necessarily have an entire mock database. Yeah, yeah. You should be yeah. able to to test based on mock data. And and that's really it. That's my nice. architecture. Okay. So so it just comes back to I try to decouple as much stuff as I can from yep. each other. I try to break it down into smallest pieces. Mm -hmm. So one, I can understand them, because like I said, I'm not super smart, so I have to break everything down into small chunks so I can keep organized everything in my brain, and I can test each individual piece. Right. All my gears can be tested without any other information around. Yeah. And that's it. Very cool. Yeah, so, 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 so like I said in the beginning, this is just my way of doing it. Mm -hmm. I, when I do talks, I do this talk around this architecture quite yeah. a bit out in the community. I always say, and I get people that come up to me and go, well, why don't you do this? And why don't you do this? And I, and I take their suggestions mm -hmm. and, I, and I'll build them back in, in this. I've had quite a few little suggestions and how to tweak things and make things better. So like I said, I don't know everything. I'm just showing you what I've learned over the years right? and try to kind of give a little wisdom out to to people. Cool. Yeah. All right. So I, I think this went really well. Yeah. <laughs> this, our series on doing web API, we saw how to build them. We saw how to test them. We saw how to um, architect, them. architect them. That's awesome. Thanks yeah. so much for doing this. Yeah. Thank you. Hope you guys enjoyed that, and we will see you next time on Visual Studio Toolbox.